a lady who was taking IELTS, uh, wanted to do IELTS. She'd never tried it before. She was from Russia, and she wanted to um, she wanted to migrate to Australia. The thing that was standing in her way was um, not having not not having a reasonable IELTS score at this stage. You are now listening to the IELTS podcast. Five, four, <laughs> Five, four three, two, one, well, go. Hello there, uh, IELTS podcast listeners. In this episode, we've got Ray Connors. He's from Australia, and he's going to give us some amazing tips regarding the IELTS listening exam, and I'll probably share a few other tips as well related to the IELTS exam. Okay, now, Ray, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do and how you help students? Please. Yes, yes, certainly, Ben. Thanks for inviting me. Um, as you said, yes, I'm from Australia and I'm an IELTS uh, teacher or, or coach, as we like to say. Um, okay, yes, we have a, we have a lot of a, a lot of tips. Uh, I've been te- just to give you a bit of an idea. I've been teaching uh, or instructing IELTS for about 16 years now, and I do a fair bit of it online these days. I don't uh, I don't go into the classroom much anymore. And uh, I, I train teachers who teach IELTS. Yeah. So, what what specific questions do you do you would you like me to uh, talk about for your for your uh, uh, clients, Ben? Right then. Okay. First of all, I get a lot of emails from students mm. who say that when they're in the eg- listening exam, they have extreme mm. difficulty coordinating both listening and writing at the same time. So how would you solve that uh-huh. problem? Okay, all right, I, I, because I, I knew you were going to ask this question. I thought you were going to ask about listening as one skill in writing, but I see what you mean now. Okay. Um, the list, list, right, listening to the questions and uh, writing the answers. Mm. Okay. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the, the, there's no uh, there's no um, mystery to IELTS really. What what we have to realise is that, uh, and I always tell my students this, that IELTS is not real English as in the real world. This is a specialised type of English which we have to train for a specific examination. Mm-hmm. Um, it's uh, it's unfortunate uh, that that what we learn for IELTS. By the time we've done the done the exam and done uh, done well in it, we don't have to worry about it anymore. Then we go back to normal to normal English, I guess you might say. Um, now, with the with the listening and the writing, this uh, the, there's nothing beats practice, practice, practice. Right? Yeah. Um, now, with with listening, one of the skills I, I have a special five five lesson um, course which I undertake with uh, with uh, the students who have got a reasonably high level of English, and it it focuses entirely on the skills only. Uh, what's needed. Mm-hmm. One of the most important ones with the listening, and to give you a lot of confidence with the, with the listening, is developing the ability to be able to predict what you are going to hear. Uh, now, so this means instead of going directly to the question, panicking and writing what you can, or you know, ticking the boxes or choosing things, is have a look at the questions first and say, okay, now what what sort of word am I likely to hear? What sort of things am I likely to hear? So it's important to spend some time looking at the questions. Uh, give yourself time to look at the questions before you actually hear and predict. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, you know, what sort of a word am I going to need to do this gap fill? Is it going to be a noun? Is it going to be an adjective? Is it going to be an adverb? Once you've got developed some confidence in doing this, um, it becomes it becomes a lot easier. Uh, if if you have a fair idea of what you're going to be listening for, of course we're not going to predict with 100% accuracy exactly what we're going to hear. But you'd be surprised with a little bit of practice. How skillful you can get with this, and having that confidence then makes moving on to the writing part that you have to fill in the details, etc., much easier. I see. So the listening, well, just getting lots of practice, and of course, um, not only the type of word, like you said, an adjective, mm. noun, or a verb. It would also right. be good working on your vocabulary, so you could generate vocabulary that you think is going to be necessary 
as well. Right, right, Imagine, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, a lot, a lot of students who come to me, they get very, um, very concerned or uh, very worried about. I don't have a huge vocabulary. One of the, you know, we, we're able to when we get used to listening or we're getting reasonably familiar with English, we don't need to know the meaning of every word. Mm -hmm. we, we, can, we can, you know, we can guess from context, we can predict from context, it must mean something like exactly. this. So it's not necessary to have a monstrous vocabulary. Most native English speakers never use any more than about 5,000 words maximum. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so it, <laughs> it seems quite quite silly to learn every synonym, every antonym that you can possibly dream up, uh, because it's just not necessary. I see. I see. Okay, then. Excellent. Now, I'll just go to the next question. If sure. A, if a student gets nervous, mm -hmm. panics mm -hmm. in, during the listening exam, um, right. do you know a strategy to overcome this? If they're like lost in the middle of the listening paper. Um, yes, there is a strategy to overcome this. Um, however, the strategy you need to put it into place well before you get into the into the examination situation, um, and that is, like I said before, uh, you know, listen to lots of lots of um, lots of uh, things that are re that are like or IELTS like, and there's a number of sites I can tell you about and I, I won't go into them right now where you can get all this for free you can listen to this stuff a lot of different varieties of of accents and regional regional dialects and things like that you know uh, the, the Yorkshire dialect uh, Australian <laughs> dialect etc uh, you know so so that you get to you, your ear gets trained to it but the 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 most important thing is if you if the student gets very well practiced in the prediction of, of what he's going to hear, etc., you should not get panicked and flustered uh, yeah. during, the, during the exam. Now, of course, that, that doesn't mean that you might not develop the jitters or the butterflies in the stomach because when, when we're put on pressure, under pressure, um, we do sometimes get a bit strange. And if we get, if we get lost, one of the things to think about is this. If you miss one question, it's not the end of the earth. So don't panic about it. Just leave it alone and concentrate on the next one. Right. You might be able to go back and guess the answer to that one from the context of the other things that are in there. One of the good, one of the things I always impress very strongly on my students is: do not leave any any question unanswered. So you can go back later and say, "Well, that passage seemed to be about blah blah blah." And question number two, I really messed that up, but it's a pretty fair guess that it's probably A, B, C, or D. And if I you don't see. know. And yeah. if you are not sure, guess, guess. Uh -huh. Yeah, you, because you've, you've got, got to, you've got to, you've only got a twenty-five percent chance that your guess is correct. Yeah, ex and you've got nothing to lose. Points aren't exactly. deducted. So if you leave it blank, it's guaranteed zero. Put something in there, it's, you've got twenty-five exactly. percent. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so that, that's what I would suggest about people getting nervous about this problem. You know. Uh huh. Excellent advice. Thank you, Ray. And okay. I have. The next question, um, I guess you've kind of answered this, uh, is what technique do you teach students to improve their listening score? With, is it similar well, to yeah. what you said before, yeah? Oh. Yeah, learning how to predict what might what might be uh, what mm -hmm. might be the thing. You know, I've got I've got some stuff here which I could show you. No, that's the wrong one. Wait a moment. <laughs> I will get the right one. Um, how, how to predict. Uh, uh, things you know, and a lot of these exercises uh, are good. You know, here's an exercise we can see here. And for listeners, I'm sorry, it's a little bit difficult. But w okay. what it says is, okay, what will we hear um, in this listening? And we can see here a, a little piece of paper. It says, drive from Melbourne to Port Phillip Island, approximately eh, 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 kilometres. Now we can guess pretty much what sort of thing we're going to hear about this this blank mm -hmm. uh, which we're asked for of course we're going to say it's going to be a number isn't it if we're going to talk about kilometers it's pretty fair to predict it'll be numbers yeah. and the next bit ta takes about uh, what well takes about what 
we're, we're talking about a drive from a place called Melbourne to Port Phillip Island. So it's probably going to be how many, how, what, what sort of a time, you know. So it's going to be so many minutes, so many hours, or so many days. Yeah. And then the next, you know, the next thing here, this is, this is putting prediction into, into action. Um, uh, people go there to observe the something returning home. Now, you know, what returns home now, an inanimate object like a tree is not going to be returning home. <laughs> so, you know, we can predict that whatever is returning home is going to be something uh, that lives. So it's uh -huh. probably going to be an animal. It's not going to be flowers. Um, yeah. You know, so uh -huh. it's going to be something that's returning home. Exactly. And the next bit, just here, uh, I'm only using this one as an example, of course. Watch seals from the something or through telescopes. So what's this last one going to be, the eh, eh, the blank? It's going to be a place, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's going to be some sort of a place. So basically, uh, th that's how the prediction thing works. Being confident in making these predictions um, is, going to, is going to solve a heck of a lot of problems. Yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Well, um, yeah. That's I'll... okay. So this is uh, how you teach using the, because just for the listeners, what Ray did was he mm. did screen share, showed me a PowerPoint presentation, and he, he walked through everything with the animations mm. and the arrows and things. Um, I'll mm. post a picture of that on the actual blog post, so go to the website, look for Ray Connor's uh, podcast, and you'll see it there. I'll put a, a screenshot there. So, um, mm. so that's how you teach, then, using the presentations and Skype. That's right, that's right. Or oh, there's a couple of other venues to teach it, but I use Skype quite a lot, yeah. Yeah, right. that's, that's how it's done, yeah. Excellent. Uh -huh. Now, if you only had seven days to prepare a very panicked, stressed out, and worried student, hmm. what, how would you do that, Ray? <laughs> Well, okay. Now, uh, coming into coming cold into an IELTS test with only seven days to prepare is rather ridiculous. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it is. You should, you know, you should be well aware well before seven days that you need it. Now, there is. Uh, I do have a course which I which I uh, uh, teach, uh, which can be done in five lessons. I normally say it has to be a lesson a week because there's a heck of a lot of study that goes with it. Mm -hmm. Now, this course is only for people who already speak English quite well. Yeah. It's a strategy course only. Mm -hmm. um, however, I have had great success with this with people who come in uh, at, at, at approximately higher level, pre-intermediate level, yeah. um, and they walk because they know what to do and they know how to go about and know what it is that the IELTS examiner looks for, um, they walk out with scores of 6.5. Um, you know, mm -hmm. which, which, is, which is pretty good from a pre-intermediate level and I'm yeah. very proud of the people who've done that and nearly everybody has done quite well who's taken it. But I do have to warn anybody who's thinking about this, it's, it sounds easy, five one-hour lessons with, with, with Dr. Ray, but you have to follow it up. Every yeah. lesson is followed up with four to five hours of intensive research and exercises and whatever. And there's right. some sites I always give my students to say, oh, you know, there's a lot of free sites out there, but there's only a certain number that are any good. Yeah. So I only ever give the ones that are good, and I know work, and I often say, okay, now this exercise on that site, I want to see your attempt at that. So there are ways to do it. However, I think anybody who comes along totally cold and says, I want to be able to take my IELTS exam in um, seven days, unless his, his or her English is good, um, forget it, wait for the next one. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So basically you, um, you get online with them, one-on-one, -on -one, and then mm -hmm. you right. walk through them, tell them about the skills, mm -hmm. and then basically say, okay, right. do this, do this, do this, come back when you've done right. everything. I see. Right. right. Yes. Well, pretty much. It's like a um, what you could do it from one lesson to the next. But at the beginning of the next lesson, of course, the big question would be, okay, did you did you do that? Uh, how did you find this? How did you find that? And uh, you know, most people who take IELTS are, are reasonably adult enough to be able to uh, to do to to realise they're facing it they're facing a, a pretty difficult task if they're trying to do it in five lessons. Mm -hmm. um, so they do, they do get stuck into it and they do it. Uh -huh. um, right. 
And okay. That, that covers for the four skills, reading, writing, listening, and speaking. Right, yeah, yes, exactly, yes. My, 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 my five-lesson, uh, five uh, shall we say, intensive course covers the four skills and an overview of what's expected, uh, you know, pretty much uh, from the get-go. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, yeah, sorry, go on, Ben. Yes, no, 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 in. sorry, sorry, I was just, uh, just nodding no, my no, head. No. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, sorry. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, just, one more, just one more question now. Uh, what's sure. the most common problem you find your students have and how do you, how do you get them to, to overcome it? Okay, um, there, there are two. There are two things which are really uh, critical, um, I find. Um, the first one is that students do not answer the question. They, 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 they go off at a tangent and don't, don't read the question very carefully. You have, to, you have to look at the question and say, now what is it that these people want me to do here or say here? Mm. So that's number one. Make sure you understand exactly what the question is. And in, in all courses I do, whenever we come across a question, I ask my students, what is it? that the examiner wants you to do here. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'll just show you something else here uh, to do with the speaking. The second one is the speaking test, and people freak out about the speaking test. Um, now, now that as, as, you, as you're aware, and as people listening to this podcast are aware, there are three parts to the speaking test. There's, there's a, a part one, which is pretty much, hi, how are you, where do you live, what do you like, what do you not like? That one's not difficult, because it's about stuff that you already know about. A part two, where there is the monologue, is the one that scares people the most. Now, if they're not prepared, if people are not prepared for it, it's easy to mess this one up, and I've seen it happen so many times. And then, of course, the third part is generally an extension of part two, but it goes into more philosophical stuff. How do you think? I um, see. Yeah, but anyway, part two, let me show you something here. Now, here's a, here's a card like the examiner will give a student, right? Describe a place you have lived. Um, oh, by the way, in part two, a little tip. Um, uh, probably over the last 30 years, 60% of questions in part two have been about a person. So if you develop a good, a good uh, vocabulary about people, it's always like a hero from your town, a, uh, somebody you don't like, somebody you admire, blah, blah. It's always a person. Right. So if you develop a good vocabulary about people, you, you've covered most of it. Probably 30% is about a place. So a good, a good range of usable vocabulary about places is going to go a long way and about the other 10% potluck <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and you don't as I said earlier you don't need a huge vocabulary remember when you when you're speaking to the uh, examiner the examiner is going to listen to what you have to say for about 12 to 14 minutes the fact that you don't know any more English than what you've just told him is something he will never know, right? <laughs> so, so, so there's no need to have, you know, 1,000 different ways to talk about something that's beautiful. All right, let's have a look at this one about a place. This is what I tell my students. You must plan. You must plan what you're going to say. Uh -huh. You get a minute to plan. If you don't use that time, you're going to, you're going to waste your effort. Describe a place you have lived in that you particularly liked. You should say when you lived there, who you lived with, what was most memorable about this place, and explain why you liked it so much. Yeah. That's just at random. Um, now, what I say to my students is how many things do you have to talk about? And, of course, they generally say... Oh, four. Uh, when I lived there, who I lived with, what was memorable and why I liked it so much. Wrong. There's five. You have to talk about the place, right? And so I say, make a little mind map. Write down what it is you have to talk about. And then uh, the next part is who. Who do you live there with? When you lived there? Why it was memorable? and uh, why you liked it. Now, okay, those are the five things that the question asks. You must direct your attention to each and every one of them. Miss out one, you've just blown 20% of the mark that you might get. You also need to rephrase the question, just like as if you were doing it in a writing, like a five paragraph argumentative essay. You have to rephrase the question. It can be something like, uh, oh, I want to tell you about a place that I lived when I was younger. I want to talk about, let me tell you about, and then, you know, you start. But 
yeah. also with this mind map, okay, the place, what country is it in, uh, for example, where's its location, the part about when, when did you live there, just as an example, childhood, I went to school there during my childhood, mm -hmm. who did you live there with, oh, my parents, some say something about my parents, they're retired, um, I also lived there with my brother who is now an engineer, this is all just to pad out, yeah, pad yeah. out, you know, to keep talking, you need to have more to talk about than you really need. Mm -hmm. um, why was it memorable? It had a long staircase. Why do I remember that? I was always afraid to fall down. It had a swing outside, and I can remember my dad made it. Uh, why did you like this place? It was full of happy memories when I played with my friends. And then you have to round it off. You have to, but you know, along with like an essay, you have to say it has to be in virtually three parts. Yeah. Say what you're going to talk about. Talk about it. Talk about what you just talked about. Say what you just talked about. So, uh -huh. uh, to let the examiner know you're finished, hey, that's my little story about a place I really liked living in. I hope you enjoyed my talk. And you have to practice, practice this to make sure it goes for between one to two minutes. Closer to two minutes is better than one minute. Okay. <laughs> so those are, so th that's the major problem most of my students have. The, uh, um, is A, not answering the question that's asked, mm -hmm. and B, uh, part two, speaking, is where everybody freaks. Yeah. And so, you know, I concentrate on that and I get people to practice this again, 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 and, and, and time them and say, now you go ahead and uh, you go at your own time, uh, use all the, use, and I give them a dozen or so speaking cards, and I say, now you, you record it, practice it until watch the timing, make sure that you cover every point and make sure that you can do it in the time. That yeah. way, you know, you walk away giving the examiner everything that he, that he is expecting. You stand out. Yeah. You stand out. You know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is awesome advice. Thank you so much for that, Ray. That is an absolute gem. So just to summarize, um, right. so you've got the question. First, you analyze the question really well. And even if mm -hmm. there's four bullet points there, you have to remember mm -hmm. the, the first sentence. In the case you just showed, it was about describe right. a place. And then you've got the bullet right. points. Um, so you're saying structure it around all five sentences, and the right. then, and for the then get a mind map going to generate content for your talk, and then structure right. it the same way as an essay, but of course right. using different language, using spoken English rather than formal academic. And, oh sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. And you just um, maybe try to get comfortable with a few set phrases or okay I would like to talk about or my little story is going to be about a place where I lived or something like that then you go into That's your, right. yes. yeah then you go into your mind map which you generated mm -hmm. in your prep for the content and then you give like a little indication to the examiner that you've finished using a very uh, natural sounding phrase like well, mm -hmm. that's my story about a place I lived when I was a uh, place I lived when I was younger. I hope you liked right. it, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah, advice. right, right. Yes, right. Because uh, you know, rounding it all up is uh, letting the examiner know I've finished now. Because too many people say, and that's it. <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> And the examiner suddenly thinks, "Oh well, that's a, you know that's a good a good job gone down the hill." <laughs> <laughs> and that's it's it. all about please. It's all about giving the examiner what the examiner expects. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And trying not to make the examiner work, making sure that they understand you. Just yeah, making their life easier as well. I imagine. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, if if you're an examiner and you've been sitting there and you've just had 100 interviews and 101 comes along and and he's terrible like the rest, you know, uh, he's bo the, the examiner's bored. He, he wants to hear something different. And when you come along and go bingo and give him exactly what he's looking for, you yeah. stand out. You're, you're better than the rest, you know. So he's inclined to mark you up. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent advice. Thank you for that, Ray. Now, final okay. question. Could you share? 
a success story that you've had with the student and like what the situation they came uh what you did and how you helped them and like what happened afterwards or yeah a successful story oh, a success okay. story or even a funny story or Let me think. well there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a few good ones oh yes i i won't mention names because that would probably be, uh, probably harsh, would be yeah. proper but <laughs> yes um a lady who was taking ielts uh, who wanted to do ielts she'd never tried it before she was from russia and she wanted to um she wanted to migrate to Australia. The thing that was standing in her way was um, not having not not having a reasonable IELTS score at this stage. Um, her her level of English was probably what we would call intermediate. Uh, she was a doctor, and uh, she took IELTS with me. And uh, uh, you know we we. We had the time to do it, so there wasn't the rush. It wasn't. I combined the uh, the what we call intensive IELTS course with also adding vocabulary and learning some new vocabulary to go along with it. Um, we worked probably I think it was two lessons a week uh, for about six weeks. So she had about twelve uh, twelve lessons with follow up follow up stuff. Um, her main purpose, she was about, she was in her early 30s and in Russia, if you're a woman in your early 30s and you're not married, you're over the hill, you've lost it, you've lost the plot. <laughs> and she was a very good looking and, uh, lady and very intelligent and she wanted to get a big bronze Aussie lifesaver for a husband. All right, so that was, <laughs> ah, okay, okay. That was, so that was, that was her plan. So. Uh, she went along a little bit nervous to the to the exam, uh, but she was very well prepared. I knew I had every confidence that she would do well. Um, so she went to the exam, and uh, you know, uh, after the after the exam was all over, I got a wonderful message from her to say, "Write on your prediction, six point five for every skill." I've just bought the ticket for Australia. I've been accepted. She got to Australia. Um, she got a job within a week. Wow! In her in her field, um, although obviously you know she'd been she'd been canvassing. Uh, uh, prospective employers. Mm -hmm. Now I have to tell you, when she got here, there were so many good-looking bronze lifesavers that she still hasn't made a choice. But she does have a <laughs> choice, apparently. So that was that was one one. Um, <laughs> another guy in Russia. He was a, a pre-intermediate level, and he wanted to take IELTS to better himself in his position uh, so he could deal with foreigners. And it's, isn't it strange that we have to have the piece of paper to prove that we can speak English well, which is a little bit silly, but that's yeah. how it is. Um, yeah. So he, he, uh, he was only looking for 4.5 and, and uh, from a very low beginning, uh, we, we took, uh, I think it was about 20 lessons and he managed to achieve and he got a promotion in his job, which is in Siberia, uh, but that's where he liked to live. Wow. So, <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's a few, but um, yeah. those are the ones that really stand out because they were, uh, they were memorable and especially the guy who got the 4.5, he was such a hard trier, you know, and uh, he eventually yeah. did well. When you was talking about the girl, I thought you was going to say, and um, she came to Australia. She got six point five, and then she came to my house and asked me for a date. <laughs> That's how it's going to end. Uh, no, I'm already married, Ben. So I, <laughs> <laughs> although she was a little tempting, I do admit. <laughs> uh, okay, it was uh, very good looking. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, right. Um, that has been an absolutely fantastic interview, and uh, thank you so much. And just for the uh, for the students listening, if you would like a class with Ray, you've probably heard more than enough to be convinced. Have a look at the. I uh, will go to the IELTS podcast site and maybe do a search for Ray Connors. And there you'll get all the details. And I'll also post some of the pictures of the actual um, presentations he showed me during the interview. So you can have a full look and get all the details there, get more information. And, um, yeah, hopefully get in contact with him. Right then. Well, thank you very much for that, Ray. Thank you too, Ben. That's great. Awesome. Five, four, three. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to IELTSpodcast.com. And remember to leave your email for updates and early access to new podcasts.